imagine a world without love? I mean, it would be it would be flat, right? It would be empty. It would be depressing. <laughs> a world without love is not a, lo- a world I'd want to live in. How about you? It's what makes the world goes r- go round, after all, right? Rumi, the poet, the Sufi poet, said, "Without love, we are a bird without wings." Imagine the frustration of a bird without wings. <laughs> Yeah, so love really is what it is all about. Love is one of our core values here at Unity of Walnut Creek, and I bet if we looked at the Unity Ministries all across the movement, we would find love as one of the core values in almost all of them. A lot of us even describe Unity as love, right? And certainly we describe God as love. And so there is this very essential understanding of spirituality of why we come together, of who we are, of what magnetizes and pulls us together and connects us as this very essence of the divine, love, this quality. It is a fourth of our 12 powers that we're looking at throughout this summer series. The 12 powers is is one of the key unity teachings uh, that Charles Fillmore carried on from his teacher, Emma Curtis Hopkins. She started out with the 12 jewels of mysticism, and he made him the 12 powers of man, later changed to just the 12 powers to be more inclusive. And so we've been through a few of the powers, faith and strength and wisdom, and today we rest on love. I bet you can guess where in the body love is located. <laughs> Charles Fillmore actually specifically says, back behind the heart. So it's a little bit deeper into the heart space, a little bit deeper into that energetic space where love is enthroned, where we tap the very essence of love. So when we are turning on this power, activating this power, it's to that place that we go and and begin to get a connection there, which is what love is all about anyway, right? There is such a, a part of it that is about this connecting this glue that binds us together. In fact, in Colossians 3.14, it describes love above all qualities. And above all qualities, it says, some of the versions clothe yourself in love. This version, put on love. Above all the qualities, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect unity. Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect unity. So is there a sense of harmonizing, of binding? And yet there are so many people in the world that are feeling a sense of not much love, friendless, alone. There's a sense of that kind of thing where there's, there's a longing for love, a desire for love, a desire for this connecting experience, this binding of, of perfect unity of harmony, and yet sometimes it feels as if it's not there for people. But the truth is, we can never be separated from it. The truth is that love permeates all things, including, of course, us. Love is always there, just as sure as if we say God is love, then divine love is everywhere present because we believe God is everywhere present, right? So there is a sense of love cannot be absent. It is only the trick of our mind that thinks love can somehow be missing or separated from us. And so whatever it is that we are desiring in this kind of wanting love to come, you know, Hafiz says, the the poet says, um, love says, come near to everything. Come near, I will take care of you. There's sort of a a caring, a, a compassionate side to this love that we'll talk a little bit about in a minute. So love is this magnetizing, this glue that sort of holds everything together, including us, right? The little vibrations of cells that magnetize themselves together in the wholeness of who we are, in the magnificence of who we are. And that holds us together in relationship with one another. Not just personal relationship, but universal relationship. That's the difference really between love, just love, small L love, and divine love, large L love, is that there is a a wider lens, a universal kind of understanding of love. It's not just about, 
as Jesus encouraged us, not just about loving our, the, those who we get along with, loving those who are part of our family or our family of choice, our close friends, but loving too what he called our enemies or loving all. Even those who push your buttons is maybe a way we might say it now. <laughs> right? Loving even those who have different perspectives than us. Because that universal love has that big picture understanding. The divine love in us understands that love is more expansive than just every individual personal relationship. Although it is through the depth of that personal love that we come also into the expansive understanding of universal love. And so it can both be through that individual depth of intimate experience that we open to the, the expansion. And it can be through that expansive big picture kind of understanding that we might zero in at times on, on that personal connection, on that depth of intimacy that love can bring us. So love is so many things. You know, how do we define it? What is love? You know, in the Eskimo language, there's 180 or so names for snow. In the English language, there's one word for love. We say, I love God. I love my sweetheart. I love ice cream. I love these shoes. You know, it's all the same word. <laughs> Seems like some pretty distinctive ways of loving, doesn't it? Some pretty distinctive ways of understanding this, this concept. Cindy Wigglesworth is a, a leader um, known for leadership training. And she also wrote a book on spiritual intelligence. And she said she was reaching, because as she was thinking about spiritual intelligence, of course, love came as the primary quality. Love came as the thing, oh, okay, so what is spiritual intelligence? It's love, right? How else can we describe it in one word? But love, the very essence of understanding the source that we are sourced from, the essence of who we are in the world, the high vibration that we feel, the base that we go to. When everything is, you know, hits the wall, what is the one thing? You know, when we come to the end of our lives, what is the one thing that matters to us? We always say love, right? Those that we love, the love of life, the love of ex that experience. Yeah, Mario, you are love and expression. We hear you. <laughs> He's got the love chant going. <laughs> This is your message. I know. I know. It's like gravity, you know, that binding, that connection of love that pulls us together, that allows us to, to really feel the essence, that, that invisible kind of substance that we are made of and that is between us. You know, so there is no separation. It's that it's a palpable kind of substance. When we are tuned in to spirit, we can feel that palpable substance. We can feel it when it feels like it's really there, and we can feel it when it feels blocked. And when it feels blocked, it's because we ourselves have blocked it or somebody else has blocked it. And so it's our choice always to open, right? It's our choice always to open. And when we open, what happens? The love pours out and the love comes in. It's that law of circulation always. Love is prosperity. Love is money. Love is energy. Love is so many things. So Cindy Wigglesworth said she was looking for a definition for love, an understanding of love, because it could be so many things. So how is she going to land on this idea of spiritual intelligence based in love? And she found this Eastern teaching, this saying that says, love is a bird that has two wings. One wing is compassion and one wing is wisdom. And if either wing is broken, the bird cannot fly. And so both are expressions of love that seem to be key expressions in our spiritual understanding. We get the compassion piece, the care, the impetus to love one another and care for one another because we know we are inseparable. We know we are linked together, not just as a human species, but Throughout all life forms, we know we are on this planet, pulled to the planet by the very love of the Divine Mother, by the love of Earth, the gravitational pull. I mean, we're not going anywhere, right? Because just sure as gravity, there is a constant pull of love that pulls all life forms together, that is meant to be the way that we interact with each other. And so one of those expressions, one of those wings is the wing of compassion the wing of care, the wing of, of um, 
caring not again just about our personal, the people in our in our personal life, but also the greater sphere, right? It's a, it's the one who advocates for justice and equality for all. That is a form of compassion. The one who cares about the person on the street or the person on the BART or the person, you know, who seems to be in distress. The one who steps in and offers a meal or a ride, as we heard up heard of earlier in our congregation, or the one who serves others out of that place of abundant love, not sacrifice, as Andoni sang of earlier, not sacrifice, but honor for the essence of who we are. That's compassion. That binds us together. We're already bound together. It's the expression of that, that binding together, of that inseparable connection that we have, that substance of spirit that links us that recognizes one to the other. My di the divinity in me sees and bows to the divinity in you, and vice versa. And even when that other is acting in such a way that you're not really feeling the love, <laughs> ever that ever happened to you? <laughs> you can go beneath that stuff, right? That ego game, that ego stuff that gets in the way. Go beneath it to make the connection. Maya Angelou, I think, is one of the great wisdom keepers of uh, conte our contemporary time. She's, she's made her transition, but her wisdom still lives with us. And she said that love is that which holds us together, that compassion wing, and it is also that which liberates us all. And that's the wisdom wing. We, we often think of compassion as an easy expression of love. We understand that. But wisdom as love, wisdom and love working together, this is a key part of the tandem nature of the 12 powers. In the 12 powers, some of the powers are more linked together than others. And this is it, the case with wisdom and love. So wisdom is, is in the solar plexus. We talked about that last week. And wisdom is represented by the disciple James son of Zebedee and Salome. And love is represented by the disciple John, the disciple that Jesus said he loved the most. And so they're brothers. And Jesus called them, without explanation, the sons of thunder. So they go together, love and wisdom. They're placed together. The, the back behind the solar plexus and back behind the heart, there's a, a bundle of nerves. They call it a ganglionic nerve center. And some call it the second brain. And so it's that place where love and wisdom come together. So, so why is that so important? Anybody ever love without wisdom? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> And so we understand that one innately, right? When, when we love without wisdom, there's a sense of desire and devotion and, and uh, maybe over-objectifying the, the, the thing we love, the one we love, right? So there's a sense of kind of getting off course, not seeing things with that big picture, right, that the bird offers us. That two-winged bird offers us the big picture, the understanding, the universal love, the divine bird's eye view. <laughs> if you will, of the whole. And so it is with the wisdom that we kind of lift off and we see, oh, okay, now I kind of see how I'm behaving and what's happening here, you know. And, and so we can infuse our love with wisdom and then it is like the son or the daughter of thunder. You know, it's not just pure passion, but it's got the power of, of the divine behind it. It's got the, the ultimate expression of love because it's tempered and, and partnered with wisdom. So the two are meant to go together. The two are meant to work with one another. So this, this love, this liberating love, what does it really mean for us to, to be liberated by love, for love to liberate us all, as Maya said? It binds us together, yes, we've understood that, but it liberates us. How does love liberate us? You know, a lot of people think of, of commitment as being sort of, you know, not allowing you to have the freedom. And yet it is, it, I found in my lifetime, it took me a long time to get this, but the deeper you go into commitment, actually the more liberation you can experience if that commitment is true to your heart. A lot of you are nodding. So you've, you've found that, that, that the depth of relationship can open us 
uh, to that depth of commitment can open us, can liberate us in all kinds of ways. It liberates us to acknowledge one another. So as we express love in its wisdom wing, in its liberation of, of the, the divine love that is wise love, that is this kind of uh, love that has got the, that base, that, that really important base of wisdom underneath it, it might look like simple ways to begin with, like liberating each other through acknowledgement. The natal people of South Africa, when they call somebody's name, they say, Sawubona. It means, here you are. So I would say, Alberto, Sawabona. And he would respond, Sikona, I am here. And so there is this sense of bringing the invisible to the visible, liberating the very presence of somebody, acknowledging by calling their name and their presence into the space. And so there is a sense of your presence matters. You are significant. Knowing your name matters, calling forth your name. If you are one who says, I'm not good with names, I encourage you to let that tired excuse go. <laughs> And give the love, because it's about love and attention, paying attention. It matters when we call somebody by their name. Here I am. There you are. It makes love visible, tangible, substantive, presenced in the room. And that's just one simple way in which we liberate ourselves in love by acknowledging the presence and the significance of one another. Another way is by accepting and appreciating each other. You know, our unique differences. Our egos love to get in these whole loggerheads, right, about I like to do things this way. It's the old tomato, tomato, you know. <laughs> I do things this way. You do things this way. You, exp you, you have this perspective on life. I have this perspective on life. I mean, anybody ever get into these problems in relationships? No. So when Brenly and I first got together, there was um, this constant thing that we would end up kind of in loggerheads about, and it was how we came to make decisions. So she would, she's one wired in such a way that decisions are quick and they're kind of more routine. So, you know, we're going to go there and that's what we're going to do. And, you know, we'll, we'll get home by X and, you know, maybe do X or Z, whatever it may be. And um, I would take a lot more time with the decisions, you know, weighing the alternatives, you know, maybe even praying about it, you know. <laughs> I'll get back to you in a while, you know. And so you can imagine how this would create friction for us, you know, just like, oh, please, would you make a decision? And me saying, oh, please, would you just like let us talk through the whole process? And so... So finally, we just, we just kept hitting, you know, rubbing up against each other on this. And so finally I said, ah, I know how I can reach her, you know, understand me, because she's a dog whisperer. I said, you know how the dogs sniff around before they find the right and perfect place to do their business? <laughs> she said, yeah, I had her attention. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Here's the good news. She said, I totally get it now. <laughs> so now we just have this little joke where she'll just say, still sniffing? And I'll say, yep. <laughs> but what's at the base of that is just accepting and appreciating each other, right? We have to come to that, you know, that is a liberation. I can tell you, that liberated all kinds of things in our relationship, and it sounds silly, but it really did. It opened things up in a whole new way, because it was like, oh, okay. And then we could appreciate each other. And she said, you know, I actually really appreciate that you sniff around, because I think often we end up with a better decision. And I said, and sometimes I really appreciate that you just kind of cut to the chase and free up that energy so I don't have to sit around thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, we kind of find those tandem places with one another where we can call forth the appreciation and liberate ourselves in love, a love that accepts, a love that appreciates. 
And then there is also that sense of liberating by, by loving with an open hand. That can be a tough one, right? That's the wisdom tempering that love, that love we talked about earlier that's all about, you know, I want some and then I want some more, right? And so I remember when I was a, a little girl, and I, I'm calling in my best friend from childhood, Julie McGill, again for the second week, so I think I need to call her. Um, but her older brother, Jeff, um, brought home a wild rabbit. I think it was injured or something. Its name was Virgil, anyway. And I got to hold the wild rabbit. And oh my gosh, that rabbit was so soft and so cute. And I remember just loving it so much that I thought I might actually squeeze it to death. And I had to give it, give it back, you know? Do you ever just love something like that much? It's just like, oh, you're so cute and soft. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, right? So you got to like have some help there, like, oh, take it. <laughs> and so it is that, but it's that encouragement not to love like that, you know, not to love and squeeze a life out of something else. <laughs> but love with an open hand, love with a kind of space that, that lets, let somebody go, you know, let them be all that they are. And love with that kind of love. This is a hard kind of love for parents, I think, right? As your kids get close to especially leaving the nest, it's like, oh, no, (laughs) you know? Yes and no. (laughs) There's sort of like that kind of tug going on, I think, a lot of times, too. And so it's that, that kind of love, like as Khalil Gibran said, your children are not your own anyway, right? They belong to God. They belong to the source of all being. They belong to to life itself. And so it is that releasing when we hold with an open hand. So Maya Angelou in her biography tells about how her, um, her experience when she was 17 and she had a baby of her own and she announced to her mother she was going to be leaving the house. And her mother said, you're going to leave my house? And she said, yes. And I've already found a room and this is how it's going to go. And so her mother said, okay. When you cross the threshold of my house, know this, you have been raised. Don't let anybody else raise you. You know the difference between right and wrong? She said, do right. And Maya talks about how for the years after that, whenever she, things didn't work out, she could come home and her mother never said, I told you so. She always welcomed her home, made her a meal, loved her up. And so I'd like you to hear in her own words this little video clip of what happened when she was 22. Love. She liberated me to life. She continued to do that. When uh, my son may have been five years old, my mother uh, would pick him up all the time and feed him. And I went to her once a month and she would cook for me. So one day I went to her house and she'd cooked red rice, which I loved. After we finished eating, we walked down the hill and she started to cross the She said, wait a minute, baby. I was 22 years old. She said, wait a minute, baby. You know, I think you're the greatest woman I've ever met. She said, Mary McLeod Bethune, Eleanor Roosevelt, and my mother, you're in that category. Then she said, give me a kiss. I gave her a kiss and I got onto the streetcar. I can remember the way the sun fell on the slats of the wooden seats. I sat there and I thought about her. I thought, suppose she's right. She's intelligent. And she's, she says she's too mean to lie. <laughs> so suppose I am going to be somebody. She released me. She freed me to say I may have something in me that would be of value. Maybe not just to me. See? And isn't that the ultimate expression of the kind of liberating, wise love we're talking about? To see the divine potential in one another and to set it free. Because we have all the reasons caught up in us as to why we can't, why it's a good idea to play small, why, you know, blah, 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 right? (laughs) All the limited ideas that we have about ourselves. But when somebody can witness for us to be that very essence of wisdom and love combined, a son or daughter of thunder showing up in our life and calling forth the truth of who we are, the best of what we are, 
that can see our potential, the possibilities in us. And we ourselves can be that for each other. We ourselves can be that for others in the world. It's easy if we begin to train ourselves to see the good. It's easy if we say, every time I hear about what's wrong, what's missing, what's not okay, I'm going to turn it around. And I'm going to see what's good, what's alive, what's working, what's, what's the very essence of the exponential experience of love that I can liberate right now in that person, in myself, in this room, in this group, in this community. And so again and again, we can make that choice. We can make that choice to liberate love itself, liberate spirit itself, like a bird released from the essence of, of its cage, if you will. And that cage is the cage of limitation, the cage of making small, the cage of a not enough, the cage of separation. And we, over and over again, choose to open the cage of our own hearts and let that bird fly. And remember that that bird has a wing that reminds us that love is always here. It cannot be separated because it binds us together. We are made of it. And it has another wing that frees us in its wisdom, that liberates us to the truth, that allows us to know that we are acknowledged, our presence called forth. We are accepted. We are appreciated. We see with the eyes of love. We feel with the eyes of love. And we give that over to the world. And we ourselves cannot help but be liberated by that. Be liberated by our own love and action. Be liberated by our own service of love. Because it is then us in expression. That's who we are. As we move toward this week of celebrating our independence as a country on the 4th of July, I hope you'll bring this essence of this this idea, this message, that it is the love inside of you, the divine love inside of you, that liberates everything. You, everyone in your life, and all of life on this planet. Can you imagine taking that in? We imagined a world without love. (laughs) Now imagine you being the very essence of what the world needs to be liberated. We are liberated ourselves and liberate the world through our love. Let's know this together, that I am liberated by divine love. Together, I am liberated by divine love. And so it is. Amen.